Good evening, everyone. Welcome to class number 66 on the equality of women and men, which is really a second uh, stage in our, or another stage in our examination of the laws of the Agdas. We're certainly not going to be able to cover them all, but uh, this is one of the critical or most critical uh, issues because it's so culturally based. Um, that uh, I thought it well worth uh, our spending one whole class on this uh, topic. Uh, first of all, we should uh, recognize right up front that while Baha'u'llah is the first manifestation to explicitly proclaim that men and women are equal, uh, that, of course, this is usually followed in the sight of God. But, of course, Baha'u'llah means that they are equal uh, in every respect, uh, in so far as powers, capacities, and in social status in every regard. So while he is the first manifestation to state this uh, axiomatically and make it part of the law, uh, this has always been true. This is not a new uh, emergence of a new reality. Men and women have always been equal. Uh, as the Baha'i writings state, it is the historical and cultural circumstances that have caused women to be oppressed and regarded either as, in the worst case scenario, as chattel or property of the male, uh, are in the, the society we have today where a large portion of the global community considers women as either having less authority or less importance, and even some cases as having less spiritual significance. So we're not going to go over every aspect of this law, but we're going to go over what are the most um, uh, salient points, and particularly because in the Baha'i law, as elucidated, well, as a, expanded uh, on in the kitab -e agdas there are certain instances where while men and women are equal, their functions are distinct. And so you have this important axiom that the House of Justice calls into uh, uh, or, or uh, explains several times, and that is equality of status does not imply uh, the uh, identity of function. So remember that phrase is very important. Equality of status does not imply identity of function. So let's see if we can get that uh, concept understood, and we'll switch to uh, first, let me share my screen, and we'll switch to the um, uh, PowerPoint. Going to do a lot of reading. I hope I'll go slow enough where it's uh, uh, clear enough. I couldn't get it all in. A lot of this is taken, well, almost everything I am going to read for you comes from the uh, authoritative Baha'i text and um, the um, uh, whole of it is taken from an article I have written that is uh, in a book some time ago called The Equality of Women and Men. So let us begin. Uh, the first thing we want to deal with, and I, I always begin uh, with this slide because, again, think of this small panel room about the size of your own bedroom, perhaps, and then from this room emanated the laws and blueprint for all that will uh, come about in the next thousand years that will change the world. It's a nice, it's a nice ironic uh, concept. Uh, mutatus matandis is implicit. Now, what does this phrase mean? It's a Latin legal term, and it means this one that that a law applies equally one way as it does the other or the same to one as to the other uh and here is um how um excuse me i have 
hit on the wrong thing. Here's how the writings explain it. In general, the laws of the Katabi Agdas are stated succinctly. An example of this conciseness can be seen in the fact that many are expressed only as they apply to a man. But it is apparent from the guardian's writings that where Baha'u'llah has given a law as between a man and a woman, it applies mutatis mutandis, between a woman and a man, meaning the same law applies in reverse. And they give an example. For example, the text of the Kitabe Agdas forbids a man to marry his father's wife, his stepmother. And the guardian has indicated that likewise a woman is forbidden to marry her stepfather. So this is, and, and, and notice as it says here, unless the context makes this impossible. So in other words, where this is not mutatis mutandis, it is spelled out. This understanding of the implications of the law has far reaching effects in light of the fundamental Baha'i principle of the equality of the sexes and should be borne in mind when the sacred text is studied that men and women differ from one another in certain characteristics and functions is an inescapable fact of nature and makes possible their complementary roles in certain areas of the life of society. Now, this concept of complementarity is another key uh, uh, phrase you need to understand, complementarity. But it is significant that Abu Baha stated that in this dispensation, equality of men and women, except in some negligible instances, has been fully and categorically announced. Now, we're going to look at what those instances are and see what the explanations are for those distinctions. So how can you have equality and yet distinction? Uh, the equality of men and women, as Abu Baha has often explained, is a fundamental principle of Baha'u'llah. Therefore, the laws of the Agda should be studied in light of this. Equality between men and women does not indeed physiologically, it cannot mean identity of function. Now, this is a statement by the House of Justice uh, and it was a very, it's a, a very important and a very a uh, carefully phrased statement that you have uh, identity of uh, or equality of status, but not identity of function. Of course, that's clear in the sense that men can't bear children. <laughs> that, that's a distinction right away. Uh, it doesn't mean they aren't uh, as good as women, and yet in some senses it, it does, as we will see in the writings. The timeliness and the law. This is something very important in regard to what I said up front, and that is that the law that men and women are equal has always been extant in the world of creation. From the time immemorial, men and women have been equal. But as Baha'u'llah says, there is a timeliness in the revelation, and that is at some points it is... Um, impossible to bring about a law, and so a law will be revealed uh, only when society is capable of instituting that law. So while you can see in the teachings of Christ or in the teachings of Muhammad the implicit equality of men and women, uh, even though the laws of created or the rules created by the uh, theologist and heads of the church and Christianity and the religions and some of the sects of Islam seem to totally uh, disdain that concept. It is not so in the teachings of Muhammad or in the st statements by Christ. So uh, what we realize then is that if Baha'u'llah is revealing this law now, it must be that we now have not only the context in which we can appreciate and understand it, but it's necessary that we now institute it in society because we're capable of doing it and because it's essential that we do so. Accordingly, we may safely presume that Baha'u'llah's revelation and explicit directives regarding the equality of women imply that humanity currently has both the experience and capacity to comprehend this relationship as well as the social circumstance to implement it in human society. 
From the Baha'i view, then, the timeliness of the principle of equality of women with men is not simply that this is one among a myriad of newly revealed verities. The very pathology and ecology of contemporary human crisis is significantly attributable to the violation of this fundamental principle. And we're talking, of course, here a great deal about uh, laws and, and so far as the making of law and in so far as particularly most grievous oppression we have um, uh, upon us in this age and previous ages, and that is war. Because the need for a complementary balance between male and female aspects of ourselves and of our collective enterprise is essential to creating a just and functional society, as several statements of Abu Ba uh, confirm, and we're going to look at a couple. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, let me imbibe some of my tea. First axiom, in past ages, humanity has been defective and inefficient because it has been incomplete. War and its ravages have blighted the world. It is well established that mankind and womankind as parts of composite humanity are co-equal and that no difference in estimate is allowable. The world of humanity consists of two parts, male and female. Each is the complement of the other. Therefore, if one is defective, the other will necessarily be incomplete and perfection cannot be attained. And of course, this reminds you, I'm sure, of the uh, analogy that the humankind is like a bird and man, men and women are the two wings of that bird. But getting back to the House of Justice statement, this doesn't mean you have two right wings or two left wings. You need the complementarity of one and the, uh, of, of both a left wing and a right wing, a male and a female. The new age will be an age less masculine and more permeated with feminine ideals. The education of women will be a mighty step forward in war's abolition and ending, for she will use her whole influence against war. Only as women are welcome into full partnership in all fields of human endeavor will the moral and psychological climate in which international peace can emerge. Similarly, the Baha'i writings state that the only reason this imbalance has occurred is the deprivation women have experienced in educational opportunity. And here's another quote from Abdul Baha. In all human powers and functions, they are partners and co-equals. At present in spheres of human activity, woman does not manifest her natal prerogatives natal meaning those that with which she is born, owing to a lack of education and opportunity. And of course, he's speaking before women had the opportunity for education for the most part. Without doubt, education will establish her equality with men. And of course, we're still in the process and only in parts of the Western world uh, of bringing this about so that in many professions you have very few women and so on. And while that's rapidly changing again, it is changing only in certain uh, cultures. Another similarly understandable but likewise counterproductive response to the injustice and subordination created by traditional gender roles has been the tacit recreation of women in the image of men. Now you may find that this uh, uh, interesting in light of contemporary discussions, this statement. Even while we acknowledge that the male's role is unbalanced, unhealthy, and the cause of much of humanity's contemporary dilemma, uh, instead of inducing balance, such a response can exacerbate the very imbalance that has so afflicted human society by producing even more human beings in the mold of the stereotypical male. So the idea is, the point is, as it will say, that the, I, well, let me just read it. What then is distinctive about the Baha'i notion of a cure for this imbalance and what is further unique about the Baha'i paradigm for a natural, proper, healthy, but egalitarian relationship between women and men? As with other social problems, 
The Baha'i position is not an Aristotelian mean between extremes, not a point of moderation between those who deem gender itself as a meaningless distinction and those who view women's role as confined, excuse me, confined to some narrow province of domestic duties. It is instead a simple yet subtle principle of co-equal complementarity. The principle is simple because it retains a sense of gender distinction as natural while affirming the absolute equality of status. It is subtle because we have come to consider equality as synonymous with identicalness, particularly in so far as discussions of gender are concerned. Yet the Universal House of Justice states forthrightly that equality of status does not mean identity of function. And that's about the third time I've stated that, but it's so it's such an important principle. So we come to this analogy of the two wings of the bird of humanity, and I've already stated the uh, essence of what it implies, but let me read uh, this from uh, the selections from the writings. The world of humanity has two wings, one is women, the other men. Not until both wings are equally develop developed can the bird fly. And that's from selections of the writings of Babel Baha. We should carefully note that in this analogy, humanity is neither male nor female. It is an independent organism that uses two distinct faculties, men and women. We should further note that neither wing has any meaning or purpose without the other. Without the other, the bird would simply go around in circles, which is pretty much a good description of the circular nature of what history, uh, of the history we have been through, if you look at it, war uh, upon war upon war. We should observe that the primary objective of the bird is neither the amalgamation of one wing with the other, nor solely the possession of two wings, particularly two of the same type, two left wings or two right wings. The goal of the organism is flight, and flight is achieved only when each wing retains its distinct identity and function, but is precisely equal to the other in power and status. That's a wonderful analogy. It's so simple, and but yet it's uh, so profound. The Baha'i concept of gene, gender distinction coexisting with absolute equality of status is thus at the heart of any pre perception of this revealed truth. Per excuse me, perception, not preception, of this revealed truth. And it must be understood and appreciated before we can hope to approach the second of our twin duties, the institutionalization of the principle. And here again, we come across this dual aspect of what we are required to do individually and collectively to understand the principle and to implement it in our daily action and in our social laws and uh, um, way of living. Uh, the institutionalization of this principle in Baha'i laws and relationships. But we quickly, quickly discover that even if we have a relatively clear sense of the principle in theory, the application of this concept of complementarity to social relationship requires careful consideration. And of course, as we know from what's happened right now in uh, the reassumption of power of the Taliban Afghanistan, that certain parts of the world are going to go through a great deal of resistance and change before they accept any of this. So uh, a lot of preparation has to be done before it can be accepted as a global concept. For example, we must begin by disabusing ourselves of the connotative responses we all share with regard to traditional gender distinction because gender roles have so often been promulgated for the purpose of suppression and subordination of women. The male had his province, the world of business, politics, the running of society, and women hers, and the woman hers, the home, the children, the church. Uh, of course, the, the, these are uh, uh, seem antiquated 
from our perspective, but our perspective living in this country at this time. Let us attempt, therefore, an objective look at some of the most obvious gender distinctions with regard to function in the Baha'i society to understand how a division of duties can exist without unjust and inappropriate distinctions of status or authority. We find in the Baha'i writings the, the, that attribute primary responsibility for the financial support of the family to the man. Now, this is stated in a couple of places, primarily in the model for uh, a will in the Kitab Yagdas, which is quite detailed. Uh, but of course, you must remember this right up front. That will is not meant to be a model for just anyone, but someone who has died intestate. Now, what does that mean? It means someone who has not followed the Baha'i law by making a will. So when you make your will, you can appoint anyone you want as the executor of your estate, men or women. So why is it that the man is given primary re financial responsibility? Uh, uh, and the woman is chief and primary educator of the children. Again, this is a generalization. Uh, as we're going to find in just a second, it is up to the individual family to decide how these roles and duties will be distributed. We may understand we blanch at the assignment of these duties solely on the bas basis of sex, uh, differences or gender differences, because connotatively these duties call to mind context in which similar role distinctions have been used to circumscribe and subordinate women. We may have an equally skeptical response to the statement by the Universal House of Justice that homemaking is a highly honorable and responsible work of fundamental importance for mankind. Uh, if we take these gender distinctions out of the Baha'i context, lump them together with some other gender distinctions in Baha'i law regarding such things as dowry, inheritance, exemption from military engagements, and membership on the Universal House of Justice, we may infer a general contradiction between the enunciation of the egalitarian relationship and the implication of that truth in Baha'i society. So let's examine this more deeply. Thus, because of physiological fact, the woman as mother has obligations regarding children that men do not have to the same degree. At least they don't have it inherently. For it is the mother who rears, nurtures, and guides the growth of the child in most circumstances. And again, as we'll find out, the individual family has to decide according to the exigencies of their own financial and uh, logistical situation, who does what. Likewise, and we may presume to facilitate the mother's duty, the father has obligations that the mother does not have, primary responsibility for the financial support of the, of the family. Again, primary but we must immediately note that these are primary areas of responsibility in the context of a marriage in which there are children. Such distinctions most emphatically do not imply that the man has no parental responsibilities or that the woman is less capable than the man of earning a living, uh, uh, that the woman does not have full and equal part in making all financial decisions or that the woman should not have a vocation. Indeed, the Universal House of Justice notes that these relationships and responsibilities must be worked out within the exigencies of each individual fa family, that, quote, family consultation will help to provide the answers. And of course, in such consultation, neither gender or sex has pr primacy of authority or status. Consultation uh, in consultation, of course, everyone has an equal voice. In addition, the Universal House of Justice notes that the role of the woman as mother does not by any means imply that the place of the woman is confined to the home. The woman is indeed of the greater importance to the race. She has the greater burden and the greater work. 
And if you don't believe that, of course, if you're a man, try doing what uh, 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 your wife does uh, every day if, she, if you work and she doesn't or you have children. Look at the vegetable and the animal worlds. The palm which carries the fruit is the tree most prized by the date grower. Therefore, though the duties in the Baha'i family relate in certain circumstances to gender, there is no intent in any of this that the woman's role be subordinate or inferior. Quite the opposite is the case, though clearly Baha'i gender roles can only be fully understood and effected in the context of Baha'i society, not in that of past or present social norms. So before we can effect these laws sufficiently well, except particularly on a global level, we have to model them in the Baha'i community and in our own families and, and uh, uh, neighborhoods uh, and bring about sufficient social change in other parts of the world that these laws will not be scoffed at. This is a statement from Baha'u'l Abdu'l Baha in Paris Talks. In no movement will they be left behind, they being women. Their rights with men are equal in degree. They will enter all the administrative branches of politics. They will attain in all such a degree as will be considered the very highest station of the world of humanity and will take part in all affairs. With this clear statement of the equality of women and men, let us consider a distinction of duties that seems unrelated to matters of raising children, the crucial matter of membership on the Universal House of Justice. How can we not infer from this distinction of function a sense of the woman as somehow less capable in some yet unknown capacity? If we approach this issue by asking ourselves, what is it that qualifies men that does not qualify women, or the converse, what capabilities do women not have that men have, then we are already we've already strayed from the logic and integrity of the Baha'i law and paradigm. In other words, uh, if you're asking that, then you're asking the wrong question because you've just been told there is no distinction. If anything, the woman is more qualified than the man in various respects. So it can't have anything to do, whatever the reason is, with equality or powers or capacity. So what does it have to do with? Once we have established that there is absolutely no distinction in human capacity between men and women, such questions automatically become illogical and unfounded. We can infer as much from Abdu'l Baha's statement that ere long, the wisdom of this distinction, and he's talking about membership on the House of Justice, will be manifest as clear as the sun at high noon. We may presume that at such a time we will exclaim, as have the women of Iran regarding Abdu'l Baha's advice to them, this was indeed supreme wisdom. Now, what is that referring to? At the time, at one time, early in the Baha'i faith, Abdu'l Baha told the women not to vie with the men in so far as election to the LSAs and so on. Uh, not that you would vie, that would imply a political action. Uh, but not to worry about it at that point until things change. In the meantime, we must necessarily confine our speculation to answers that deal with circumstantial explanations. Now, what I'm getting at is here that the women in Iran understood the wisdom of his uh, advice, uh, giving them, uh, telling them to not worry about it now, it'd be worked out, and it was worked out. Uh, at the time that he told them this, had they uh, voiced concern uh, and so on, it might have caused uh, an unnecessary uh, turmoil. When the time was ready, even as the time is ready for this law to be implemented by the manifestation, it must be gradually implemented throughout the world as well. 
In the meantime, we must necessarily confine our speculation to answers that deal with circumstantial explanations. Now, what does that mean? It means that since it can't be the equality that's at variance, then it must be something else, something that has to do with present circumstances, even as the circumstances at the time Baha Abdul Baha told the women of Iran about not worrying about not being on the LSAs. So we must wait the time when it will become clear why we are told that it is not uh, possible in this dispensation that women be on the house of justice. And when it, we understand it, we won't need to ask uh, whether or not it's the right answer because it will be clear as the noonday sun. Well, uh, unless you shut your eyes or you're blind, you will understand. Uh, there are many people who think they already understand, and perhaps they do. Uh, we won't know until we know. <laughs> and when we know, we'll know we know. Even if we accept that there is a special logic and just explanation for every gender-based distinction of function in the Baha'i community, the wisdom of each of which we will in time behold, what can we conclude about the nature of gender itself, quite apart from the assignment of duties? Which attributes ascribed to women and men are real and which are artificially derived from antiquated notions of status and function? In other words, when we say, well, that's a very feminine quality or that's a masculine quality, and yet do we know what true masculinity is our true femininity, our true humanity. Well, of course, uh, there's an exercise. I say, of course, um, there is an exercise I used to do when I would teach this in class. I used to teach a seminar uh, for all uh, graduating seniors. And uh, I taught this uh, concept of the equality of men and women uh, you know, to have the class examine it. And one exercise I did that was most revealing was uh, without the class understanding at all where I was going, I said, now what, give me the qualities that you most frequently associate as being male characteristics of, of, of the, I, I would even say not just every male, but a, 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 good, a good man. What, what, what qualities would, uh, would characterize a, a man? And so we made one column on the left-hand side of the board. These are the ma male characteristics, and I won't try to go with the, through them, but uh, needless to say, there were some traditional things like courage, valor, uh, steadfastness, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, and the woman was, you know, there were things like sensitivity, uh, uh, empathy, uh, uh, b b b loving, and, and so on, caring, and so on. I said, and, and then I covered up both of those columns, and I said, now, I want you to describe what to you would be the perfect human being. Well, I, I think you probably can anticipate what happened, and that is, it turned out that the perfect human being was a precise combination of those two columns, that the man was, was someone who was so uh, uh, powerful and aggressive and so on that you wouldn't want you had anything to do with him, and the, the woman was so, uh, so, so sappy, as they were described in the right column, that uh, she wouldn't be able to accomplish anything much, you know. Uh, and so, what we realized is that the, the ideal human being is, is the uh, complementarity or uh, combining of qualities of both what we would have traditionally considered male and female characteristics. So we really don't know what attributes ascribed to women and men are real uh, at this point because we haven't developed a society that can produce women and men in the roles that they are most capable of playing are, uh, are regardless of roles, since those aren't assigned. Uh, but you do have this. 
Most probably, we must conclude that for the present, we cannot know with certitude anything much about truly sex-determined or gender-determined traits in the human species, since we approach such questions from the perspective of our own limited background and biases, and since the emergence of a valid and healthy of uh, valid and healthy distinctions, whatever they may turn out to be, must await a social context that is itself conducive to fostering such distinctions. In some passages, Abdul Baha seems to imply there are inherent and permanent gender traits. Uh, I'm not positive that's, that they're, they're permanent, but they, they seem to be, and let's look at a couple of them. He states that woman has greater moral courage than the man. She also has special gifts which enable her to govern in moments of danger and crisis. Now, you would think if you asked you know, most people, they would say quite the opposite, but that's not what Abu Baha says. That the woman is more tender-hearted, more receptive, her inten intuition is more intense, and that in sciences and arts, in virtues and perfections, ye shall become equal to man as regards tenderness of heart and abundance of mercy and sympathy, ye are superior. Now, again, I don't know if that's a permanent thing or not, but it, would, it seems that he is talking that way. This, this is axiomatic. Of course, these distinctions may be appropriate all only to our present circumstances, wherein men have largely lost a sense of their so-called feminine traits. But it is interesting that in each of these distinctions, the feminine attributes cited are viewed not as signs of weakness, are as alternative virtues, but as additional and as indications of superiority. So, uh, I'm going to uh, use what I think is a useful analogy taken from the writings that you may have uh, kind of wondered at as you read the Kitab Ad, as we will do in a few weeks. Uh, the, that is the uh, Book of My Covenant by uh, Baha'u'llah, where he talks about the Agsan and the Afnan, the twigs and the branches. You will notice that the tree, of course, symbolizes the manifestation, and the branches and twigs are the male descendants, and the leaves are the female descendants. Now, we don't know that these are permanent appellations that will... Uh, continue, but they're in the writings used that way poetically. And this is a thought that I had when uh, uh, analyzing this. We may find one helpful key to understanding more generally this principle of co-equal complementarity in the metaphorical appellation Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l Baha used in addressing women. On the one hand, they sometimes employed the epithet leaves, Bahia Khanum was titled the greatest holy leaf. Certain men, on the other hand, have been designated as branches and twigs. If the tree represents the attributes of God given phenomenal form, or the Anisa, the tree of life, or possibly the human race itself, what is the relationship between the branch and the leaf? Is one superior to the other, one more vital than the other in the thriving of the tree? Their functions are distinct yet reciprocal and co-equal. Each is necessary for the survival of the other, even as Abu Baha has observed that the husband and wife are two helpmates, two intimate friends who should be concerned about the welfare of each other. Furthermore, it is only when both function so as to complement the other that the tree can prosper. The branch channels raw fluids and nutrients to the leaf, perhaps as the father of the household provides the sheer financial wherewithal for the family, and the leaf takes that potential and through photosynthesis uh, changes this raw substance into kinetic chemical energy. As we know, photosynthesis takes place because the leaf is capable of using sunlight, and in the scriptures, sunlight symbolizes spiritual and intellectual guidance. Metaphorically, then, the appellation leaf seems to designate the woman as the key instrument by which enlightenment and evolution of human society takes place, 
possibly because it is she who by instructing the children translate the potentialities of the revelation into kinetic virtues. Now, this is not from the writings. This is my own idea, so you can take it or leave it. Finally, we are faced with the existential dilemma of trying to live in two worlds at the same time. One that is dying and suffering the pangs of that death, and the other world not yet fully born. The one that we envision when we read the writings of the Baha'i faith, particular, as I've said so many times, the society as it is spelled out in detail in the works of the Guardian. We are challenged, therefore, to discover for ourselves the elusive and constantly changing point of balance between trying, on the one hand, to respond courageously to present injustices, and on the other hand, attempting to fashion, however embryonically, the society envisioned in the Baha'i Commonwealth which alone can ultimately elucidate and fully implement the equality of women and men. Of course, this is a dilemma, a dilemma we face with every social problem in all of the laws of Baha'u'llah, since Baha'is perceive an inescapable relationship between abstract virtue and the expression of those verities in the edifice of human society, as well as a social ecology wherein no single issue can be resolved piecemeal as an isolated or autonomous pathology. Well, that sounds very scholarly and erudite and perhaps a bit muddy. So let me clarify. I read today that we may suffer some global food problems because of the war in the Ukraine. We've already noticed that uh, other conflicts uh, between us and Russia and so forth are calling causing the uh, recession and the escalation of inflation and the high price of gas and so on. We are, in effect, as Baha'u'llah said, it didn't say we are citizens of, uh, of one country. Uh, it didn't say we will become citizens. He says we are citizens. The world has already become one integrated communi community. So you can't uh, solve it the problems piecemeal. You can't say, okay, we'll solve the food crisis, uh, and then we'll solve the problem with global warming, and then we'll clean up the Pacific Ocean. And in other words, you can, none of these things can be resolved until you have a foundational commonwealth that will bring about uh, uh, all the changes uh, in a coordinated uh, and collaborative way. For example, we cannot curtail drug abuse until we create a society sufficiently healthy that it no longer desires to escape from the realities of its existence. Uh, in the same way, we can only, lim uh, with limited effectiveness, pursue the equality of women and men until we fashion a just and healthy social context to nurture that organic relationship. As regard the membership on the International House of Justice, and this is a letter from the Guardian, who uh, at, at some times in his earlier letters would refer to the Universal House of Justice as the International House of Justice. It's the same institution. Abdu Baha states in a tablet that it is confined to men and that the wisdom of it will be revealed as manifest at the, as the sun in the future. In any case, the believers should know that, as Abdu Baha himself has explicitly stated, that sexes are equal except in some cases. The exclusion of women from the International House of Justice should not be surprising from the fact that there is no equality of functions between the sexes. One should not, however, infer that either sex is inherently superior or inferior to the other, or that they are an unequal in their rights. Uh, repeating more or less the same thing we've, we've covered. This is as evident as the light of the sun at midday, except to those who are spiritually blind. Now, this is not referring to the equality of men and women or women, why women aren't on the house of justice. This is Baha'u'llah Abdu Baha talking about another matter, but I thought it was very viable uh, uh, that uh, 
even if the reason for women not being on the House of Justice is as obvious at the sun, if we are afflicted, if we are spiritually blind, we won't be aware of it. So maybe it's already apparent why they aren't. But if we are not opened to thinking clearly about what's going on, we may not see it. And he continues with another analogy, Abu Baha does. If we are afflicted with a cold, we cannot inhale the delicate fragrances emanating from the rose garden of the divine kingdom. The principle of equality between women and men, like the other teachings of the faith, can be effectively and universally established among the friends when it is pursued in conjunction with all other aspects of Baha'i life. And that's the integrated approach I was referring to uh, a couple of slides ago, that you cannot deal with these laws and implement them and these teachings on a piecemeal basis. Well, that's the end of my slide presentation.